Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. This tape is designed to acquaint you with the instruments and the procedures used in the first clinic session. I will review for you the instruments which we are going to use in the first clinic session. And we will also review on a patient the criteria for the normal gingiva and the inflamed gingival tissues. Following that, I will show you some material on the recording of plaque scores and the calculation of the plaque score index. First of all, let me begin by reviewing for you the instruments that you are to bring with you to the first clinic session. Remember, these instruments should be sterilized prior to bringing them to the clinic. The uh, mouth mirror, of course, you are acquainted with already, having used that in an earlier section of this course. The explorers, there are two explorers that we wish you to bring. One is the cowhorn explorer, our number three explorer. The second explorer is the number 17 explorer. Number 17 Explorer, you can see, has a very fine tip right there on the end. It's a much more delicate explorer for exploring for subgingival roughness than is the Cowhorn Explorer. In your experience here at the university, you will use two different periodontal probes. Both of them are, are of essentially the same design. This is the Marquis Denver Dental Probe. And you can see that it has millimeter markings at 3, 6, 9, and 12 millimeters. It is designed to be thin and tapered, so it's easily inserted into the sulcus. The other probe used here at the University of Michigan is the University of Michigan O probe. This probe has millimeter markings, which are divided. Let's see if I can get you a good angle here at three millimeters, at six millimeters, and at eight millimeters. This probe is also thin and tapered to easily enter the sulcus and is similar in design to the Marquis Denver dental probe. In addition to the sterile instruments which you bring to the clinic, you will need to pick up a number of disposable items from the dispensing desk, such as the patient napkin or bib, two by two gauze squares, the disclosing solution and applicator. The final article that you will pick up at the dispensing desk will be the plaque control score form. This form is used to score the plaque on your patient and to calculate the plaque index. Now let me demonstrate to you using a patient those landmarks which you will be expected to show an instructor in the first clinic session. The first recording we'd like to make is a recording of the identification of the free gingival tissues. The free gingiva can best be measured by first of all inserting the periodontal probe in the sulcus. And here you can see we have a measurement of about two millimeters. Transferring that measurement to the outside of the gingival tissue we have a zone of about two millimeters of free gingival tissue. The measurement of the width of the attached gingiva is the next procedure we'd like you to do. The attached gingiva can be measured in the following manner. First of all, with a periodontal probe, measure the distance between the mucogingival junction and the free gingival margin. In this case, we have a measurement of about four millimeters. Now by subtracting the total width of the gingival tissues, by subtracting the free gingiva from the total width of the gingival tissues, you have the width of the attached gingiva, which in this case is about two millimeters. Again, the next point is the identification of the mucogingival junction. Mucogingival junction is the demarcation between the alveolar mucosa. This is alveolar mucosa. It is shiny and non-keratinized. This is gingival tissue, 
and the demarcation between the alveolar mucosa and the gingival tissues is called the mucogingival junction. The next step in identification of the normal gingival landmarks will be to identify the interdental papilla. The interdental papilla is the extension of the free gingival tissues interproximally, and it is represented by this area here. Following the uh, recognition of the interdental papilla, you should be able to point out the free gingival margin. The free gingival margin is the coronal extension of the free gingival tissue around the neck of the tooth. Once you have identified the free gingival margin, you should then proceed to measure the distance between the free gingival margin and the cemento enamel junction. And it's done in this manner. Using a marquee Denver dental probe, I would angle it at about a 45 degree angle to the junction between the crown of the tooth and the root. Slide the tip of the probe gently down the enamel surface until it meets the prominence indicating that it's at the junction between the cementum and the enamel. This is called the cemento enamel junction. Let me also point out here that when I'm using a probe, I always have a rest finger in place. This enables firm, sure placement of the probe. It's impossible to take this instrument and freehand it out here like this. Use it like a pencil grasp, like so, and always take and use a rest finger to rest it against the surface of the teeth. Next procedure is to measure the depth of the sulcus or periodontal pocket. Now in contrast to the angulation you used when you measured for the cemento enamel junction, which is at a 45 degree angle again, we'd like you to turn the probe and direct it in the long axis of the roots of the teeth. In this way, the tip of the probe slides down the surface of the tooth and enters the gingival sulcus. And in this case, you can see we have a sulcus measurement of about two millimeters. It's important always to have the tip of the probe angled so it's running against the hard tissue or the root surface of the tooth. If it's out here in the soft tissue, then you stand more of a chance of probing only into the soft tissue and not entering the depth of the pocket. Once you've uh, measured the depth of the sulcus, I would just check around to see if there are any areas of gingival recession. It's not always a common finding. I, if you looked at these lower anterior teeth here, you would see that, for instance, on this mandibular central incisor, the free gingival margin is almost at the cemento enamel junction. It is slightly more coronal on these teeth here. If there's any marginal gingival inflammation present, please examine the mouth to ascertain its presence or absence. I would invoke the criteria used for the gingival survey. In other words, look at the color of the tissue. And uh, just to review for just a minute, you'd see the mark, most marked color changes, say, in gingivitis at the free gingival margin, which will be just this tiny area right here, not extending much beyond that. Now, with gross amounts of inflammation, you will see inflammation extend in color change down into the attached gingiva. As far as form changes are concerned, you, again, you would look for the rolled gingival margin. There's not much in the way of you know, rolled margins here. You would see more of an inflamed gingival papilla, a little bit puffier. Uh, if you look at this papilla right here, it is just slightly puffy. Looking at uh, density changes, uh, you take the periodontal probe or explorer and just touch the tissue lightly like so. And if it is very soft and edematous, this is one of the clinical signs of irritation or inflammation. The sulcus depth we've already measured and bleeding tendency, if, if there is any bleeding tendency of the tissue on light probing, uh, you may add that to the criteria that would be invoked for uh, discovering the presence or absence of inflammation. 
Now, just another word here about some of the etiologic factors. If you were examining, say, for the presence of super or subgingival calculus, supergingival calculus, you can largely see uh, accumulating over the crown surface of the tooth. And uh, I'm showing you a labial view here, but you would see in most people the heaviest accumulation of supergingival calculus would be on the lingual of these lower incisor teeth. And you can determine its presence by either, you know, scraping over the surface of a tooth or by just blowing a gentle blast of air over the calculus, which tends to dry it out and make it somewhat chalky in color, and uh, it makes it a little bit easier to see. If the calculus is subgingival, you would take and use the tip one-third of the explorer. Maybe in my thumbnail I can demonstrate to you here a little bit better. If we take and rub the explorer, I want to use the tip one-third. Not the very tip of the explorer like this, but the tip one-third. And don't get it out away from the tissue like this, because then you'll be exploring into the soft tissue. Always keep the tip of the explorer tight against the hard tooth surface. Let me demonstrate to you here using the tooth again. Put the explorer down in here, and just gently, using a rest finger again, just gently place it subgingively. And it will slide right down until you just meet gentle resistance there at the depth of the sulcus. And you just work all the way around the tooth, exploring for the presence or absence of subgingival roughness. Now, in addition to the cow horn explorer or number three explorer, you may also use a number 17 explorer. 17 explorer, again, you will remember, has this small tip on the end here. It's a very delicate instrument, and many times it is easier to um, use, particularly in the lower anteriors, um, than the cow horn explorer. And again, if you were going to use this explorer, you would turn it and enter the depth of the sulcus all the way around, and just taking it down until you meet gentle resistance in the bottom of that sulcus. When you're at the bottom of the sulcus, you'll see the tissue just blanch just slightly. Now, if you're going to use it in approximately, you would turn it over here this way. Now, once you've completed uh, the review of these procedures, then I would suggest that you have an instructor check your proficiency in each one of these areas prior to recording a plaque score on your patient. Let me now demonstrate how the plaque score is recorded. Now I'd like to demonstrate to you the method for disclosing the patient so that you can visualize the amount of plaque on the surface of the tooth and also for recording the plaque control scores. Take a cotton swab and dip it into the disclosing solution, getting a liberal amount of solution on the swab. Be careful that you do not spill any of the solution on the patient's clothing because the stain will not come out. Then I would move to the mouth and retract the lip and cheek with the mirror. Take the disclosing solution and more or less flood it on all of the teeth so that both the interproximal and the buccal and labial, air, labial areas of the teeth are covered. This may take a number of applications of disclosing solution. If all the surfaces are not covered, all the plaque will not be disclosed. Once the patient has been disclosed, then you can let them you can use the water syringe in the cubicle to let them rinse out. While the patient is rinsing, let me demonstrate the plaque control score form to you. On the plaque control score form, the teeth are numbered from 1 all the way around to 32. The maxillary teeth are represented at the upper portion of the chart and the mandibular teeth at the lower portion of the chart. Each of the teeth is divided into four sections on the chart. Looking at this tooth here, number eight, the tooth is divided into the buccal segment, 
the lingual segment, the mesial segment, and the distal segment. Each of these segments will be recorded for plaque scores. When using the form, it's important to first of all record the patient's name in the lower left-hand corner of the chart and the date in the lower right-hand corner. And please write legibly. Now let me move to the mouth and show you the recording of the plaque control scores in the patient's mouth. The first thing you should do is to record the missing teeth. The missing teeth in this case are tooth number one, number 16, number 32, and number 17. In recording the plaque control score, only plaque limited to the gingival one-third of the tooth is scored. This is the plaque that is most significant from the standpoint of gingival inflammation. Plaque located more incisively on the tooth is not important from the standpoint of this control score. Beginning with the buccal or labial surfaces of the teeth, plaque is first recorded on the chart in this manner. Plaque included between the mesial line angle and the distal line angle on the buccal, in other words, this area here, is recorded in the buccal quadrant on the chart. We notice that on tooth number seven, there is no plaque in this area. On tooth number eight, we have plaque in this area, so I would fill in the quadrant on that chart. On tooth number nine, there is no plaque in this area. Moving to the lingual, I would record the plaque scores in the same manner. Plaque on the lingual is located on number seven, right around the gingival margin on the lingual of number eight, and at the gingival margin on the lingual of number nine. Following recording of plaque on the buccal and lingual, I would then record the plaque on the mesial surfaces. Plaque recorded either on the mesial buccal or mesial labial or the mesial lingual of the tooth here on the inside, will be recorded in the whole quadrant. We have plaque on the mesial of number seven, on the mesial of number eight, and on the mesial of number nine. After the mesial surfaces have been recorded, then proceed to the distal. The distal of number seven shows plaque. Maybe I can show you that a little bit better with the mirror here. If you look very closely there, you can see that there's a good deal of plaque on the distal of number seven. And if we move back again here, I can show you that there's plaque on the distal surface of number eight. And turn your head a little bit this way and there's plaque on the distal surface of number nine. Instead of completely filling in each one of the quadrants, it is adequate just to mark a small dash in each one of the quadrants recording the presence or absence of plaque. The plaque control score is calculated in the following manner. This patient has 25 teeth. There are some 68 recorded quadrants recording plaque, which would give us a present index of 68%. In other words, 25 teeth would be represented by 100 quadrants. 
And if 68 have plaque, we would have a plaque index of 68%. Now over a period of time, you notice that this is on the initial or first visit from the patient. Over a period of time, you would expect a reduction in the plaque control score to a level approximating 10%. This chart here demonstrates the presence of plaque on approximately eight surfaces, giving a present index of about 8%. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.